Just next month, we expect to see the unveiling of the first AC-75 race boats, which be used in the America's Cup this year. This video will arm you with all the background information that you need to fully appreciate the designs. We have trawled through two years worth of recon videos. We'll talk through what the competitive advantages may be of some of these features. So without further ado, I'll bring my good friend, Bob Gullen in. As always, get involved in the chat with your own theories and speculation. Um, I guess the, the, the big thing to say is there's actually not been that many new hulls in this cup so in terms of looking at a track record of where the development's going well really it's only Ineos and Luna Rossa with the LAQ12s who have actually built a hull the rest of them are using either one design AC40 which yeah was a new design but probably just you know kind of plagiarized from the um, from Tirahutai and then the rest of the teams are effectively using old tech or the one design. So um, it is a bit of a shot in the dark in terms of speculation. We've got, not, not got a lot of lead into it. Let, let's go through some of the um, like big features of the hulls from the last America's Cup and get your take on whether we'll likely see them again. So some teams had a skeg or a bustle to begin with, which is kind of like a moth hull stuck to the underside of the hull. And then all the teams eventually went that way do you expect the teams to go that way again? Yeah, well, I guess the first thing to say is like last time we saw teams, like every team sat down, and looked at the piece of paper that was the rule, and then off the back of that had to go and design a boat. So they knew nothing. No one had ever seen an AC-75. The, the first rendered images we saw of AC-75s were like TP-52s with full open cockpits and like grinding pedestals in them and people ducking under the boom and stuff. So what people imagined might be an AC-75 was kind of who only knew. Whereas this time, if you were one of the teams, you'd at least have in your, you know, you'd have modeled up every variation that you'd seen in the last cup. You'd have run that through all your analysis tools. You'd have taken the AC-40, you'd have scaled it, you'd have taken successful boats and less successful boats from the last cup and, you know, run all of those through your, through your simulation tools just as a starting point. So. No one is going into it blind this time, which is probably the main difference. Um, so yeah, last time people were launching without skegs because that was a feature of yacht design that none had seen since the IOR days. There's probably no one working in half those teams had even imagined a skeg. Whereas this time everyone has seen the success that the skegs brought teams in the last cup. Skeg Brussel, I, I take it you think I, everyone will go I just think everyone will do it. I, I mean, I remember the last, I remember talking to someone who was involved with Ineos in the last cycle. And when they saw the Team New Zealand boat with the bustle, they were like, yeah, whatever, we're just gonna like windward heel and ride on the windward chine and the foil and we'll take off that way, it'd be way better. So, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, that sounds like a ridiculous idea, but people literally had no real idea at the time and it was, Probably when they saw how well that boat was going, it was a bit of a, like a shake up in all the teams and scrabble to catch up kind of thing. So yeah, I think this time bustles. And then the other factor is that totally different venue. So waves in Barcelona, you don't like, you don't want a big flat, fat hull smashing into waves. And also you don't want to be flying a big fat hull really high above the waves because they've all realized how trying to seal the hull down onto the water, get that end plate effect, gives them a good performance gain. So I think based on kind of previous experience, success of previous boats and venue, I think we're just gonna to have to see bustles. Yeah, I think I think we'll um, see a double downing on that basically, really deep bustles. Looking at the wave height, two meters, one and a half meters in Barcelona on a typical day with a, no. the, the arms just not long enough to, to accommodate that. So you're gonna be clipping waves. So you just have to get a, a form which A, kind of end plates it, but B is um, yeah pretty okay with being slammed through waves and a flat yeah. bottom isn't that. A more moth or kind of, well, like you would see on a catamaran hull to just slice through and take those hits. Yeah, I think that'll be the interesting thing. I don't, I don't think it's a question of whether people have bustles or not. It's gonna be a question of what those bustles look like. So we like, you know, you like the idea that you can have a bustle so that as the foil is generating enough lift to counteract the healing moment of the boat, 
the boat essentially becomes balanced across the lift from the foil and the buoyancy from the bustle. But that's good, great for takeoff. But if we're essentially saying you could tow the boat up on the foil and then foil the whole race anyway and never touch down and never need takeoff, then kind of who cares? You might start looking at a bustle design that's way more focused on how easily can it pass through waves without slowing the boat down. So I think that might, that might be an area we see teams going in different directions. So what Rob just said got me thinking about the size of the bustles and um, I went away and had a look at some of the images of Lingi bringing their boat out of the shed and transporting it. Um, I also read an article where Ray Davies says there wasn't actually many photos which you could tell much about the Silingi boat. But I beg to differ, differ because I've come across this, um, across this one photo of a Lingi uh, in the shed and you can see it's actually mounted upside down in the cradle. Um, and first of all, you can see how large the bustle is, um, kind of going with what Rob just said. But the other reference point we have, as well as the cradles, is what looks to be the foil wet box, and in there, the foil cant axis. And we know that foil cant axis has got to be 520 mil above the measurement water plane. So that puts a measurement water plane somewhere on the bustle, telling us that there is enough volume, this bustle is basically big enough to float the whole yacht. Straight away, we can see how large this is, but also how little stability the boat would have sat floating entirely on this really narrow bustle. Um, so certainly something pretty, pretty radical there. So just to anchor it back from what we've seen the other teams develop, so I've already said, you know, there aren't actually many new hulls in this cup. The only two hulls we've seen are Firminius and Luna Rossa, both which went for bustles. Ineos have actually even been playing around with the bustle. So it's not like there's something they just stuck on because it was there last time and forgot about it. It's actually something they're actively thinking about how the different shape would feel so i just think every indication is even though we've got limited hulls is that we're going to see bustles be a feature and it's going to be like you said more a matter of like the specific geometry of them another big feature of the last america's cup was team new zealand's tunnel deck um this was significant because what they actually did was um lower the deck around the mass rotation point so the mass didn't sit on the deck there was an extension for the mass that took it below the mass rotation point and allowed that really deep um deep tunnel and what that did was allow them to put extra sail area down low where there's um where you have less healing moment from that sail area um, and that's what they did last time so that's another feature we should be looking at and it it's kind of interesting so the AC40, which is a new boat firm at New Zealand, doesn't really have, has a slight dishing of the deck, but you wouldn't call it a tunnel deck. Um, going for the other teams, Ineos's AC, um, LEQ12 is just a flat um, deck. It doesn't have, um, doesn't have any dishing to it around the mast. Um, but um, Luna Ross's um, mini t Rahutai is, is basically a copy. Um, so they obviously are looking at tunnel decks. What what do you think? Do you think we're going to see this feature return? Well, we can discuss this before the video. I, th I think it's really interesting and thinking about it a little bit more since. You, you effectively have this freeboard maximum height of 1.7 metres above the measurement water plane. But that measurement water plane versus your baseline of the boat and effectively how much boat you have below the water will change based on your bustle geometry. So even things like the tunnel deck kind of come back to decisions you make for what's below that static waterline. Um, I, I don't know, like, why would you move away from a maximum freeboard boat? I guess it's less frontal area, so good for aerodynamics. It's bad for global stiffness of the vessel. If you imagine the boat, it's just an I-beam you're trying to bend that I-beam through forestay and main sheet and mass pushing down in the middle, like the taller that beam is, the stiffer the boat's going to be. So you're really getting into the kind of minutiae of 
details and like, I feel like teams might start cutting down on the freeboard height uh, and this then starts to relate to another thing that you've seen which is people are pushing crew inboard on some of the boats particularly a lingi so if you can push your sight claws inboard they obviously need a certain amount of hull depth to be able to get a static bike in there but you're your driver and your trimmer sitting outboard don't really need much hull depth at all to sit in. Like, look at the AC40s, it's probably just about enough for a, a bucket seat. You sit with your legs at the same height as your bum, like a kind of Formula One driver in a cockpit type thing. Yeah. So, so I think what we might see is a move towards not just dropping the middle of the deck, but just dropping the whole deck. And it made sense to have the pods on the outside of the boats because you had members crossing the boat. So when when, if they're crossing, you want them at the furthest point away for extra writing moment. But we assume now with only eight crew and what we saw with Luna Rossa and the dual helm setup that we won't see people crossing sides, in which case there is less reason to put people out to the side in pods and instead find a way to have them tucked down low and just have the deck globally low. Yeah. Um, Talking about those cyclers, there are options to have recumbent cyclers as well lying down. So that allows you to get the um, freeboard yeah. down lower as well. That that would be cool, wouldn't it? Or as you said, like they need to get some like Graham Aubrey involved yeah. and get go prone cycling. Yeah. But I think I think that's unlikely because we've seen quite a lot of videos of guys training quite a lot on bikes, and if you were <laughs> If you were Ineos and you were going to be on recumbents, you probably wouldn't be out with the Ineos Grenadiers riding around on your fancy yeah. Pinarello dogmas. You'd be riding around in recumbents. <laughs> I think so. I, I also think it's actually incredibly difficult to put the power out in a recumbent as well. Like They, they are so efficient because of the aer yeah. aerodynamic aspect of it, which does come to play here, but you could hide a human sat up on a bike and just upper yeah. body took down so um, I think there's less reason to go for that and yeah like a recumbent's great if you want to ride zone one for 18 hours yeah. and go really far but not very good if your goal is maximum power out for, for 20 minute race which it I mean we said if they're not swapping sides and there's no reason to have them outboard what but what other advantages would there be of having people inboard yeah, and like you look back to the last cap and you saw so American Magic with their first boat started with everyone pretty much at the back putting weight over the rudder. But again, I think we've seen the techniques evolve. So when people are taking off now, they tend to take off by the stern first. Um, so you don't really want the weight in the back. And then also we've seen this kind of shift where it looks like people are trying to make the boats pit Pitch instable is probably not the right word, but they, they want the boats to have a tendency to pitch forward as much as possible. So they're moving the foils as far back in the window as they're allowed to, and they're trying to push the weight forward. They, and the, the gain there is that if you can then start using your rudder to resist that forward moment, you're generating writing moment out of your rudder. So pushing, you know, the, the boats have a, you know, there's a window where the LCG of the boat can be, there's a window where the foil can be. So those two things are kind of limited. But if you can take four guys, so yeah, if you can take your four guys at the back who maybe, I mean, they're not the cyclos, they might not be the heaviest, but say they're 80 kilos each, that's a good, good chunk of weight. You're moving two meters further forward in the boat. So it's probably the most significant weight shift you can make. Yeah, yeah just to go into that point again Eff effectively the rudder because that's offset to windward of your lifting foil any lift that that rudder is doing is kind of going against the or is adding to the healing moment of the sail so it's, it's not doing your writing moment any favor so the less work you can do with your rudder to lift whether that or even actually pull down at the back yeah. in an ideal world would give you extra writing moment so the way you need to do that then to get as much weight over the main lifting surface, the foils, um, to lift the boat out of the water. And yeah, there's two ways you can do that, moving the crew forward. And we've seen them all move from the last cup where they had um, wings, which were kind of like level with the arms. And now they're all back 
all the wings are actually back behind the arm. So they've moved the wings back and the weight forward just to get over that foil and have the rudder do as little work lifting as possible, or even actually pulling down, adding to the righty moment. Yeah, I and mean, the really extreme example of it is when you watch the, um, the F-50s in Sail GP, their windward rudders are producing serious downforce to the point that if they do the bear away and the windward rudder comes out of the water, they can capsize the boat because they lose so much writing moment from that. Um, do you think there's going to be... I, mean, I think, I guess what we're saying is we can't imagine, or, well, we are imagining a T. Hutai Mark II with possibly more bustle, deeper bustles for the swell. We're talking about crew maybe taking out the pods, the pods mellowed out a little bit, crew move forward. And do you think there's any gonna be any curveballs around there which you think are outside chances of features we might see? I think we might see some interesting aerodynamic features incorporated into the decks to try and like clean up flow around the lower sail plan. Like organizing that flow i mean effectively you're used to selling dinghies where you've got a boom reasonably high and you always just set the outhaul to be a little bit tighter than the batten up because you know that if you make it do too much work it's just going to spill out underneath the boom whereas they've not got that they have got an end plate so they've got this opportunity to really make that bottom of the sail work hard for them but the flip side like you said especially if they have pods is then actually organizing that flow I think yeah. the difficult thing compared to F1 where you see a lot of organisation of the flow is that you've got a tack, so the flow is not always, you know, it's going to be 30 degrees different tack to tack. Whatever features you put on have to work. Well, the penalty of having them on on the, on the leeward side potentially has to uh, be outweighed by the benefit of organising flow on the windward side. So stuff like that would be quite interesting to see if they, if they do add those little features. One of the other things I'm interested to see is actually the bows and I think we're all pretty set on the bustle but how the how the bow merges into the tack point so one thing we've got no idea from from the leq 12s that have been built is around that jib tack point because they effectively always put the tack point on the bow to maximize the sail plan size so it's closer to a 75 scale for the length but you know, the actual 75s have the tap point way back from the bow. So actually what you do in front of the tap point with the deck and organising flow up yeah. could be... How low How low can you go with your bow pretty yeah. much? Yeah, so the, the tap point we know has to be 1.5 metres above the measurement, well, the water plane, effectively measurement water plane. Um, so we know that's got to be a certain height, but how much they try and scoop up air or... Yeah versus and obviously if you're scooping up air if you bow get if your bow gets particularly low you'll start scooping water so there's that side of it as well so there's a bit of a trade-off and we there's some nice i'll put up on the screen nice like um bow on photos of tiru tie from the last cup where you can see that kind of like the underside of it is is kind of like a almost like a motorboat kind of like got those yeah. twin scallop shapes coming out but then the top side is this nice curve rounding up to the tack point um, so I think we could see some development around that. She threw all the key points on hulls to look out for um, as these boats hit the water, but there's plenty more to be said around the control systems for the sails, which will be very visible once boats are launched and um, critical, as we all know, to the success of these boats is a full design, lots going on there as well. So we'll come back, um, the full gang for the future episodes. So um, yeah, stick around.